Unity of Houston is an inclusive church where we seek to understand and live the teachings of Jesus and other spiritual masters. At Unity, we welcome all people from all spiritual paths and every walk of life. We celebrate the diversity of our city and of our world, and we teach love, tolerance, and oneness, seeking to live in harmony with open minds and open hearts. Wherever you are in your spiritual path, you are always welcome at Unity. Join us and discover that the life of your dreams is already within you. I was uh, talking to my friend Maggie Cole when I was out visiting her in California. We had a beautiful Sunday afternoon conversation before I went back to the airport. And, and I got, you know, sometimes those conversations take you to the very core of your being. And the, what I heard myself tell my friend Maggie was that um, I don't quit. That there's, that is a, a core belief, an identity that I hold about myself is that uh, I don't quit. It gets hard, but I stay. I'm grateful for my parents for teaching me that. I'm grateful for this community that supports me in that. I've seen too many people quit before the miracle. So hold on. Someone needs to hear that this morning. Hold on. Hold on. That's not what I was going to talk about today. It sort of is. So... Today, my message is called Honoring the Seasons of Life. And there's a question that I'm going to be addressing in this morning's message. It's, do I stand in my faith or do I accept life as it is and surrender? This is a mature teaching. This is a... a, Because really what I'm asking us each to do is find our inner discerner. And to know which is the the right thing for this moment. Do I stand firm or do I give it over to a higher power? So today, I have a joke. And you'll be pleased to know it's a short one. (laughs) Thank you, Lyle, who gives me supplies of these that he uh, curates from the internet. Welcome to middle age, where your brain tells you not to do it, but your body also tells you not to do it. (laughs) Isn't that great? So I want to begin this morning with a reading from the Hebrew Scriptures. This is from the the Wisdom Writings. That includes the Book of Psalms, the Book of Proverbs, the, the Song of Solomon, and this book, Ecclesiastes. And this is from chapter 3, verse 1 through 4. There is a time for everything and a season for every activity under the heavens, a time to be born and a time to die. There's a time to plant and a time to uproot. There is a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to tear down and a time to build up, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance. In unity, we would say that there is divine intelligence underlying all reality. Repeat after me. There is divine intelligence intelligence underlying all reality. reality. I don't have you repeat after me very often, but that felt like something. We need to hear that. We need to hear that in our own voice. Because when life seems crazy, and when things are falling apart... It's hard to remember the truth that there is divine intelligence underlying even this. As human beings, we tend to like what makes us comfortable. Is that just me? Really? You don't have that issue? We like comfort and ease. And I don't know about your life or your world or your 2020 or 2021, (laughs) There is a lot of discomfort. Things are not moving the way that I had submitted my request in some ways. And what do I do about that? Well, I can rail against it, or I can trust that there is divine intelligence underlying all reality. You see, we don't have the 
I was going to say luxury, although it doesn't feel very luxurious. We don't have a devil <laughs> to blame stuff on in unity. We believe that there is only one life, one source of all good, and it is always revealing itself into expression, even in those places that it doesn't look like that to our human limited perspective. That somehow even this will be resolved into the good of God. Nothing is out of place. When Scripture says that, that he sees every sparrow when it falls, that, that God knows the number of hairs upon our head, which I have fewer than I used to. When God knows this, it means that there is divine intelligence underlining, underlying, surrounding all reality. Nothing is happening outside of God. And when we're going through something hard, this will comfort us and guide us and restore us to a sense of faith. And what I want to remind us to, this, I'm going to use this nature metaphor of the seasons for a moment. Now, I know in Houston we can experience them all in one week. We don't have much of a winter and spring. Oh, we've had a couple of pretty springs the last couple of years, cool and extended but sometimes it goes right from, you know, well, you've heard that joke, I've told it before. The four seasons in Texas, it's almost summer, summer, still summer, and deer season. So uh, that's, that, we don't really have that sense of those who are in the Midwest and other places, we get a full four seasons. We don't really have weather like that, but there still is some, we still see it. All of the trees have to go through those cycles of, of the dropping their leaves and being dormant, putting out the buds and then the full leaf. That happens. And every season has a gift. And if we think of it metaphysically, metaphorically, that spring is a time of new intention. The slate has been wiped clean. I am making new choices for a new chapter of my life. How many of you have felt the longing for some spring energy in your life right now? Summer is the season representing full bloom of life. Everything is full. It's a season of abundance. It wouldn't feel that way if we didn't have air conditioning in Houston, but it is a, a season of fullness. Autumn is the time when we collect the harvest of our spring intentions and our summer full growth, and we begin to let things fall away. And winter, the season that I personally resist the most, where something asks us to get quiet, to stop doing, to turn within and let things be empty. As Ameri I'm an American, and I think that's an American characteristic. We like things to be full and active. And if it's not, we'll go work something up. So these seasons all move in our lives, and they don't, when I'm speaking about it spiritually and emotionally, obviously it's not tied to a 12-month calendar or the, the journey of the earth around the sun, we, but we understand, right, that we go through seasons, and each season we're in, whether it be a difficult one or an, a peaceful and joyful, abundant one, they all have a gift for us. And if we can release our resistance then we can begin to discern and receive the gifts of this season. So as I mentioned, that this is a bit of a mature talk that I want to talk about, because here's, here's what I want to say. The main question that I've been sort of pondering this week is, when do I know? When do I know what season am I in? When do I know that it's time to, to surrender and accept life on life's terms? And when is it time for me to stand in my faith, proclaim my good, and not move? You get to answer that for yourself. I'm not going to give you the answer, but I'll give you a clue. If you've been beating your head bloody against this thing for a year, you might consider letting go. Accepting life on life's terms. This is probably not the path of your unfolding. <sighs> if, on the other hand, you've been stuck in a rut so long you have hung curtains, <laughs> nothing has changed except maybe you're a little more bitter than you were 10 years ago when you were in this same pattern. 
If there's any victim energy here, well, this really isn't my fault at all. It's because of whatever. Then this is an indicator that what might be asked for from you is to claim your good in the universe and stand firm in your faith. And I'm encouraging all of us to feel, where am I? What is the season? Where, what feedback is the divine intelligence underlying all reality giving me in this moment? Listen. And I will tell you one more clue here. Um, whatever your predominant pattern has been, you're probably going to need to do the opposite sometimes. That if you tend to be a little, I don't know, stubborn, then it could well be that the universe is going to continue to give you lessons and opportunities to surrender. And if you've been a little passive, the universe is going to continue to give you lessons and opportunities to stand in the truth of your being, to find the inner strength that is yours and rise up in it. Okay? Where am I? All right. So one of the things that I've noticed... Um, recently, which is one of the areas that I'm personally sort of like, how much do I fight this battle of aging and how much do I just let it be what it is? I will tell you, our culture has a thing against old people. Have you noticed it? Everyone's supposed to look 26 forever. I saw a thing on, uh, somewhere. Um, a very well-known celebrity had posted pictures after their new facelift. And the comments people were giving were like, oh, my God, I need that doctor's number. Oh, my gosh, she looks amazing. Can you believe? She's in her 70s. Um, and she, I will tell you this, two things. There are no wrinkles. But to me, she didn't look young. <laughs> and the second thing, it didn't look like her. <laughs> it, was like, it was like sort of this sculpture of what someone might have looked like if they had, I don't know. And honestly, if that is your thing, I'm not telling you not to get plastic surgery. I'm really not. But I am asking you to move with the seasons of life. That when we're trying to hold on to something that was of a previous season, it doesn't work. And it keeps us from the good of this current season. This is a reading I found. It's a poem, short, by Samantha Reynolds. And it was accompanied by a beautiful picture of a Native American woman, just old and ancient and beautiful. The poem is this. I am not old, she said. I am rare. I am the standing ovation at the end of the play. I am the retrospective of my life as art. I am the hours connected like dots into good sense. I am the fullness of existing. You think I am waiting to die, but I am waiting to be found. I am a treasure. I am a map. All these wrinkles are the imprints of my journey. Ask me anything. Can you feel the power of an old woman like that? an old man like that, owning the, the gift of every season, every year. And if you want to do that with a facelift, we'll have to rewrite that wrinkle line, but okay. But to be in the, the, the gift of it. I want to share with you a, one of a story, or kind of the, one of my relatives, one of my favorite relatives, um, my uncle David. Ira David Gott was his name. My great-grandmother who was the Pentecostal prayer warrior. I've shared some stories about her before. Her first four children, she said, they all began with I. Ivan, Irwin, Ira, Isla. And uh, my grandpa was Ivan, the eldest. And then his brother, Irwin, changed his name to Pete. <laughs> and then my, un my great uncle, Ira, chose David, his middle name. Say. So he was always my uncle, David. Well, Uncle David, um, and then there was a fifth child, the oops, that came many years later, and his name was John the Baptist. She got religion by that point. His name was literally John the Baptist Got. <laughs> She'd given up on the I's, moved on to the J's. <laughs> Uncle David was not like his brothers. He was soft, effeminate, small. His brothers were, I knew them when they were well into their 60s and 70s and beyond, they were tough, tough old guys. 
But at a young age, they knew there was something different about their little brother. And you know how, I don't know why kids sometimes find that weakness and poke at it. But he was bullied terribly by his brothers and his father. You know, they didn't have an understanding of what sexual orientation was in that day or gender expression. There was no sense of compassion around that. He was just different and it was wrong. And they punished him for it. He got out of that town I grew up in as quick as he could. He was drafted into the Navy in World War II. He was in training in California and the bullying resumed there. And he went to his superior officer and he said, you cannot deploy me, they'll kill me. He said, no, you just, just butch it up a little bit. He's like, no, this is, I know, I won't, they will kill me. And my sweet Uncle David stood in that truth. And so for the entirety of the rest of the war, they had him work on the base in California and he was given an honorable discharge from the United States Navy because he spoke up for his truth. That, do you know how rare that was? This was the 1940s. Amazing integrity, my Uncle David. So he was discharged right there in Northern California. He, with a lot of other gay men at that time, kind of created that community there in San Francisco. And he, he had $800 in his uh, discharge pay, and he put it into California real estate. He bought a tiny little houseboat on San Francisco Harbor. He said he fixed it up a little bit and sold it for a nice profit. And then he started flipping houses in San Francisco in the 50s with his partner, um, Ed, who they were together for 49 years before Ed made his transition in the 90s. And, and then, you know, they had, it had gotten a little expensive for them to buy in San Francisco, so they went to where it was cheap, in Marin County. <laughs> Any of you know, who Cal who know California know what a joke that was. So he purchased a home in Terra Linda in Marin County, and he had to finagle and work to get it to work out because he, he never made much money. He was a, um, a clerk in a pharmaceutical company in, in the city. And then in his 50s, he just said, you know, I think we're done working. He sold that house, and he also owned some other real estate that he had been able to purchase and, and moved to where it was really cheap in Sonoma County, right up the road. And you get this. He did well. Very smart with his money. My Uncle David never um, once showed any interest whatsoever in any sort of an interior life. I just, I, he was happy. He was gracious. He was generous. He was authentic. But for whatever reason, he, I kind of perplexed him. I, I, when I um, came out in my um, late teens, early 20s, some, he was kind of estranged from the family, but my dad always loved Uncle David, and that, that connection was reforged. And, and uh, I believe that uh, um, it was a big, the relationship my dad had with his favorite uncle really helped my parents' relationship with me in those years. And Uncle David and I became close, and I'd go visit him, and he was uh, very disappointed in my struggle with alcoholism, very disappointed in my money problems, but he never gave up on me. And uh, when I began to do my spiritual work and healing, I tried and talk to him about it, and it was like I was speaking Chinese. He just didn't get it at all. But what an amazing soul, what an amazing gift. And I, I watched him pass through those seasons. He was in his 70s when he and I became friends, and then Ed died, and that was a season that he... He grieved, but with grace, and, and then he knew it was time to sell that place in Sonoma County. It was out in the country and moved to a small apartment in Santa Rosa, and he did so with no pain. Just, this is what's happening now. He's still dated in his 90s. <laughs> Amazing man. I saw at 75, the doctor said, you're going to need a new knee, and he said, well, I'm going to die. I'm not going to get a new knee. He finally had the surgery at 91. And the recovery is a little tougher at 91, so I'm going to encourage any of you, get it done. You'll be grateful you did. It was only the last couple of years. He, he was still driving at 93, though probably shouldn't have. <laughs> I'll just say that I, the last time I was in the car with him, I just, it was a little, little interesting. But at, at 96, he left this earth. And those last two years were hard. He would always remind me what Betty Davis said, that growing old ain't for sissies. <laughs> Required courage, willingness to readjust the way you think about yourself and life. 
But what a great role model for me and what a gift he has been in my life. He didn't hold on to the past. Like I said, he didn't. He did have some unforgiveness about his brothers and his dad. And my father used to try and talk to him about that in spiritual terms. And Uncle David was never able to make that that leap into accepting of his everything about his path as being right. He he carried that to his grave, but he was a great man. That's my uncle David. Charles Fillmore was the co-founder of our movement. Another character. This is what Charles Fillmore said when he was 94, just a short time before he transitioned. I fairly sizzle with zeal and enthusiasm as I spring forth with a mighty faith to do the things that ought to be done by me. I fairly sizzle with zeal and enthusiasm as I spring forth with a mighty faith to do the things that ought to be done by me. You feel that? This was a man who wasn't living in the past. Next week, it will be my 10th anniversary on staff here at Unity of Houston and my fourth anniversary as senior ministry. Thank you. And that's... I figure after this long a relationship, I have the right to meddle in your life a little bit. <laughs> uh, my friend Cynthia Rexroth, who has since passed from my church in Dallas, she would sometimes say when I would speak there, she's like, Preacher, you done quit and preaching and gone to meddling today. <laughs> so I'm going to meddle for a second. I know you. Some of you have lost your sizzle. Some of you are languishing. Some of you are longing for an earlier time in your life in this church. You're longing for a different time. And here's what I want to remind you. And, you know, I was trying to, like, put this together because I knew that I wanted to share Charles' amazing quote and my Uncle David, and I knew that I wanted to talk about not clinging to those earlier times because, I'm, you know, I'm 55. I'm recognizing that uh, I'm not young. I'm not 26. I am firmly seated in middle age. And to accept that, I, I have shared this before, our dear Patty Briggs, one morning I came to church and she's like, Michael, are you tired? You look tired, baby. And I said, no, Miss Patty, this is just what my face looks like now. <laughs> You've, you've been seeing it for 10 years. It's, it's different than it was 10 years ago. And I was, I've always kind of heard Charles' amazing quote about springing forth with, with you know, a, what is the phrase? Spring forth. Mighty, faith. Mighty faith. Ooh, yeah, to do those things that ought to be done by me. I've always kind of felt that, like he's sort of hanging on to some youthful energy, but that's not what it is. It occurred to me this morning in the shower as I was getting ready for church. You see, he was not clinging to the past because when we cling to the past, we have cut ourselves off from the energy of the now. If you're unwilling to let a season go, that has died. You have depowered yourself from what wants to happen now. Imelda Shanklin, another early Unity writer in her book, um, what, are, what is that book? What are, you? what are you? Thank you. Jean Marie is my Unity scholar who I keep on the front row to help me with this stuff. What are you? She has an amazing passage where she talks about people that complain about they can't do what they used to do. And she said, why would you want to? Only a fool tries to do what they used to do. You should be rising in God. Every decade, every year, doing new things. Would you really want to be doing what you were doing at 19? Come on. That our work is to embrace every stage of the journey to be present in every season of life until we breathe our last breath. And when we do that, life supports us. <laughs> I want to read to you briefly uh, 
This is from David White from his book, Consolations. He says, disappointment is a friend of transformation. What we call disappointment may just be the first stage of our emancipation into the next greater pattern of existence. I know you're disappointed. I know you're sad that it's not the way it used to be and that it's not the way you hoped it would be. I know, I am too. But if we will feel that disappointment, don't push it away, just be with it. Don't judge it, just be with it. And that is a part of the grief that is clean and good. And we can let die what has died. And then we're free to see what God has in mind this spring. Because make no mistake, spring is coming. Spring is coming for us all, for this church, for our beautiful planet. New ideas, new intentions, new inventions, new possibilities, they're coming. But until we grieve what has lost, what has been lost, we will not be able to genuinely create this next new chapter. I think I'm almost done. What else do I want to say? Oh, yeah, I want to share with you, uh, I came home from my travels, and we've had a lot of losses in our community, uh, none COVID related, and um, yeah, I'm, I'm meeting with uh, uh, Richard Dick York, and he and Marlene who sat in this nine o'clock service for years, many of you, they've been a part of the church since the 70s, and Marlene made her transition, and I'm meeting with Dick and his daughters this week to t plan her service, which is gonna be on the 11th, and uh, what an amazing life this woman has led. And when some, and she was ready, oh man, was she a truth student? When she found out she had this illness, she was like, I just don't want to linger. And she did linger longer than she wanted. But there was no hesitancy about releasing the former and stepping into the greater glory of her yet to be. She knew. But this week I did two memorial services, one Friday and one yesterday, for members of our community who were taken suddenly and in the middle of life. Yolanda Pope, many of you know her. Um, I'm not exactly sure how old Yolanda is, but around my age, sweet, sweet woman, passed suddenly. And then uh, on Friday morning, I did a service for, for Anthony Smith, 48 years old, husband, daughter, two teenage daughters, and motorcycle accident hard. And at his, I, as I was talking to Louise on the phone, preparing for the service a couple of times, of course, just this was the love of her life. They had a marriage that other people aspire to, you know, one of those marriages that people just love the way they love each other, love the way they love their family. You know, Anthony uh, was loved bigness in life. He loved adventure and motorcycles. He, liked, he, uh, he taught his daughters how to change the oil on the car and do all that maintenance. He just was so engaged. But Louise told me, she said one thing, they were so happy, they're from South Africa, but, and they moved here, and, and they had just both completed their U.S. citizenship within the last few weeks. And she was talking to me about that, and they were so grateful to have found unity that they always had this belief that they've done this before. <laughs> and she said, Michael, I think Anthony and I have had millions of lifetimes together. She said, it hurts that he's gone. And she said, what I noticed is those last three months before the accident, he kept completing things. Just kept completing. She said, I am convinced that he was done. He had done everything he needed to do. And so even though it was a sad service and there were a lot of tears and there, there was no time to prepare and people are missing him, there was also this great sense of a life well lived. He didn't linger in previous seasons with regret. He lived. When we let go of the season that has ended with grace and sometimes with grief, it opens us up for what wants to happen now. 
Would you join me in prayer? In this moment, I remember there is only one life. That life is God's life. That life is perfect. That life is my life now. That life is the life of everyone within the sound of my voice. Each of us living the eternal life of God in this very moment. And what I'm aware of is as we move in and out of form for all eternity... In incarnate reality, everything changes, everything is temporary, and sometimes we get stuck, we get caught. And so the word I speak over this community, over these individuals listening now, is a word of freedom, of release, that we can let go of whatever form is seeking to die in our lives because we are born of the formless, eternal essence of God itself. And so we trust, we allow, we we release, and we simply surrender to the life that is already ours, and nothing is out of place. We are guided perfectly to the, the right choices, the right actions for the right season in the right moment. We can trust ourselves and trust the divine intelligence underlying all and within. So truly all is well. Truly God is here. God is here within. God is here all around. And so we do release and let go of anything that is not needed in this moment and we trust that we are being lifted, carried, guided, guarded, and directed into the greater yet to be of our lives. It is good, it is good, it is good. And so with deep thanks, we let it be. And so it is. Amen. If no one has told you today that they love you, I love you. God bless you. Thank you for watching this message today. I'd like to invite you to join us in person here on campus at Unity of Houston for Sunday morning or Wednesday evening services. If you can't be with us here on our campus, you can still join us live on Facebook or on our website, unityhouston.org. Sunday mornings at 11 a.m. Central.